National Research Platform Contested Legacies. Uh, today's lecture will be given by Professor Peter Verowsek from the University of uh, Groningen. Um, Professor Verowsek will be speaking to us about collective memory and conflicting visions of sovereignty in Europe. Uh, the title of his uh, lecture is The Mnemonic Battle Between Liberal and Illiberal Democracy, Collective Memory and Conflicting Visions of Sovereignty in Europe. Uh, Professor Verowsek is an assistant professor uh, in the history of and theory of uh, European integration in the University of uh, Groningen. Uh, among his core publication is the book Memory and uh, the Future of European Rapture and Integration uh, in the Wake of Total War, uh, published in 2020. Um, and uh, his today's lecture will be focused on the uh, issue uh, of um, two divergent understandings of democracy, uh, liberal and illiberal democracy, uh, which emerged after 2004, uh, after the accession, accession uh, of a um, first uh, post-communist um, post states uh, to the European Union. And um, uh, on uh, related problem of uh, different memory cultures. And um, before I give the floor to our speaker, I'd like to remind you uh, that we'll dedicate 15 minutes for discussion after the lecture. And now, Peter, uh, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much um, for that very kind introduction um, and also for inviting me um, to give this talk um, through uh, yeah, the International Platform Contested Legacies. Um, it's a really interesting project um, and I'm happy to be able to contribute. Um, hopefully you can all see my slides um, that I've prepared um, just to sort of help uh, help you walk through my help me walk you through my argument. Um, and Basically, um, this argument that I want to make to you today is really uh, motivated by a kind of empirical and historical puzzle um, within European integration and European politics more generally. Um, if you think back right to the accession of the first post-communist states uh, to the EU in May of 2004, so almost 20 years ago, um, that was a moment of real euphoria. And there was a sense that sort of after the fall of communism in 1989 and with the sort of accession of these states to the EU, um, that Central and, East, and Eastern Europe would be able to sort of quickly um, converge with Europe, not only in terms of sort of political and economic structures, um, but also in terms of wealth, um, economy, social structures, and that sort of um, that all of this would lead to a convergence within the EU and an end of the kind of division of the EU between East and West. Um, and that it would sort of, that the European Union would sort of really be completely unified or that Europe would be completely unified in a way that it hasn't been or wasn't for almost a hundred years. Um, however, sort of the puzzle that I'm interested in today is that after 20 years of membership, common membership in the EU, these divisions still persist, right? In many ways, sort of the Iron Curtain is still very much present. Um, if you look at sort of um, economic indicators, political indicators, um, if you look at sort of different ideas about democracy, different ideas about what integration means, the dividing line between sort of different, between different wealth, of wealth and all sorts of other indicators is still the old Iron Curtain. In particular, I'm interested in sort of the rise of illiberal democracy, which is also sort of defined by or which has really occurred within those post-communist states. And so I think that this sort of lack of convergence um, and in many ways actual divergence since 2004, right, because um, the states of East Central Europe had to adopt kind of um, European forms of liberal democracy in order to be accepted into the EU in the first place. And what we've seen since then, instead of further convergence, is an actual divergence with the rise of this kind of 
illiberal democratic model in, in, in particular in Poland and Hungary, but also of course elsewhere um, to a lesser extent in places like Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and even attempts in other parts of East Central Europe to adopt this form, including in my native Slovenia. Um, and so my basic thesis um, today is that actually we can root these differences and sort of explain this puzzle um, by looking at the different frameworks of memory that are operating in Central Eastern Europe and in Western Europe. And that actually those frameworks of memory lead to these diverging understandings of democracy, of sovereignty, and ultimately of what the EU ultimately is and should be. So in order to make that argument, let me just briefly say a little bit um, about memory. And I know that sort of we've been talking about this a lot uh, as part of this platform. Um, but I think sort of a lot of the attempts, if you look at, if you sort of think about this divergence and the, or the lack of convergence, whatever way we want to think about it, there's a lot of um, writing by sociologists and in particular by economists um, on this phenomenon. Um, but I think that we need to look at the realm of culture and in particular the realm of memory in order to understand sort of how populations in different parts of Europe look at the world differently and understand the world differently. Um, and, and sort of this argument is part of a broader memory boom. Um, I mean, that some people date back to the 1970s, but with, I think actually has really taken on much more recently um, that has reshaped how we think about European values. And this boom, this memory boom really emphasized how our commitments are rooted in past experiences and in how we interpret those past experiences. Um, and in general, sort of collective memory or sort of regimes of collective memory, memory cultures usually provide stability by legitimating existing regimes, right? They provide arguments that help the regime to say, you know, we came to power in this way, um, there, we have a long history, or we have a legitimate history, um, and that gives us the right to rule. Um, but for my argument, what is crucial is that there are these kind of key moments or historical ruptures um, in those kind of stabilizing narratives that allow change to happen. And these ruptures um, occur at kind of key moments and they operate in such a way that they create a gap between past and future of such a magnitude that the past, while still present, is fragmented. Um, and that's a quotation from uh, Sheila Ben Habib. And the whole point is that these ruptures sort of, they delegitimize those existing regimes of memory. And by sort of creating this gap or fragmenting the past, they allow for new regimes of memory to come together, new narratives that take the elements of the past and put them together into a different story that legitimizes a different kind of regime, a different kind of politics. Um, and in the wake of such ruptures, um, leaders working along with sort of um, cultural entrepreneurs are able to reshape how populations think about the past by reshaping how the space of experience feeds into horizons of expectation. Um, and my basic argument is that I think there are sort of two competing ruptures or two competing um, frameworks of memory and oper operative in Europe today. Um, one that is based on 1945 and one that is based on 1989. Um, and these ruptures, I think, are the result of a chain of experiences that have forced, forced communities to rethink fundamental values. And once in place, right, these ruptures, which changed the previously sedimented narrative, sediment themselves and become the foundation for new regimes as well. Um, and as I mentioned, right, politics in Europe today, I think, is defined by these two separate ruptures. And what I want to argue is that these ruptures lead to, and the different understandings of the past that they sort of per per perpetuate, um, have important legal and policy implications um, for the e for both domestic politics, but also for the EU and European politics more generally. So let me say a little bit about each of these uh, different ruptures before sort of saying a few words about what they mean for the EU. Um, so the rupture, the initial rupture, or the first rupture that I would talk about is the rupture of 1945. And this is the rupture of Western Europe. Um, this is the rupture that leads to the foundation um, the original foundation of the EU um, in Western Europe, right among the original six member states um, in the early 1950s. 
And it is a rupture that really emerges directly um, from the experience that those six countries had under um, Nazi totalitarianism or under Nazi rule, right? In the case of Germany, obviously sort of that rule was domestic for the other, um, other, the other five of the original member states that was, it was based on the experience of Nazi occupation. Um, and the whole European movement in Western Europe after the war really comes out of the resistance movements. Um, if you look at the various leaders, key leaders that were involved in the original foundation of the European coal and steel community, Euratom um, and the other sort of uh, European economic community, um, almost all of them were active in the resistance movements in their home countries, right? People like um, Jean Monnet, I mean, he was active actually, uh, he was in the UK and in the US sort of providing help to resistance movements. Uh, the same is true, Konrad Adenauer was in hiding in Germany. Uh, Robert Schumann was also very active in resistance movements um, in both in France and in Germany. And I think the same is true of a lot of the kind of individuals you look at who come to prominence in the post-war period in Western European politics. And for these individuals, um, the idea of pursuing Europe is essentially rooted in their experiences and in their memories of the recent past, um, in particular of sort of their experience of Nazi totalitarianism. And I have this quotation up here from Hannah Arendt. Um, and this quotation comes from a piece that she wrote in 1945 in the Partisan Review um, in the US. And it's her attempt to kind of explain to Americans what is happening in Europe um, and sort of the general political uh, ideas that are occurring there. And Hannah Arendt was a member of the resistance herself. Um, she was kicked out of Germany in the 1930s and then spent a few years in France and was part of the resistance there before ultimately um, escaping uh, from a constant, from a internment camp in France and emigrating to Europe, uh, to the US. So she knew what she was talking about. And in this essay, she writes, those who emerged to wage war fought against fascism and nothing else. All of these resistance movements at once found a positive political slogan, which plainly indicated the non-national, the very popular character of the new struggle. That slogan was simply Europe. And those capitals um, are in the original manuscript. Um, so building on sort of the remembrance of the Holocaust, the memory culture that comes out of these resistance movements and that is involved in the foundation of the EU um, emphasizes the need to protect individual rights. It seeks to ensure that nation states can no longer deploy national law to kill the juridical person um, at both the national and the supranational level. Um, and I think this is sort of, I'll pause here and I'll repeat this again um, very briefly later, but I think it's really important to sort of recognize the policy implications, right, of sort of the experience of Nazi occupation, and in particular, the way it ultimately gets to, gets to be thought of or represented by kind of the Holocaust or the paradigmatic kind of image of Auschwitz um, in the West, where I think we tend to think of sort of, when we think of the Holocaust, we think of the industrialized slaughter um, of a large number of individuals um, from subaltern groups. Um, but I think for a lot of these post-war politicians, what was perhaps most important um, and the lesson they drew from it was that actually sort of killing people is rather difficult as long as they have status, um, right? It's actually very difficult to kill your own citizens because if they're your citizens, they have rights, right? So before a person could be killed um, in a death camp, the first thing that was done was their citizenship was taken away, right? And then ultimately, right, their, their citizenship is taken away, that allows them to be sort of taken to a concentration camp. Um, there, so their citizenship is taken away, they don't have rights anymore. Then you take away their name and replace it with a number, right? We all know about the tattoos that individuals were given. And then once you have made a citizen into sort of a person, and then that person into sort of just a number on a page or just sort of an image of bare life, kind of to speak with um, Jojo Agamben, um, then it's much easier to kill them, right? So the idea of protecting rights, citizenship rights, and ensuring that even non-citizens have rights is a way to combat what was seen as the essential evil of the Holocaust. And then um, in terms of sort of looking at World War II, the lesson that a lot of these people drew was that 
it was actually nationalism that was fundamentally the problem, right? That nationalism drove um, the essential sort of, that nationalism was the driving force behind the war in the first place, right? So those are the kind of two things, right? You want to end war and you want to ensure that something like the Holocaust can't happen again. You need to fight nationalism and you need to sort of ensure the rights of individuals, both at the national level, but also at the supranational level so that nations can't take those things away. Um, so that sort of experience or those kind of that memory culture based on the Holocaust in the West um, leads to sort of the classical narrative of integration uh, based on spillover and the four freedoms, right? Those are kind of the more functional parts of it. But in addition to those kind of functional parts, um, the memory of the fight against fascism plays a really key role um, in this narrative. And I think sort of Tony Judd captured this idea best when he talked about uh, the Holocaust or recognition of the Holocaust as being the European entry ticket, right? As being something that was non-negotiable um, for entrance into sort of the EU, um, at least for the perspective of the West. Um, and again, right, I'll repeat sort of the key lessons for the present in this narrative are this idea, right, that nationalism leads to war. And second, that in order to prevent sort of the recurrence of something like the crimes that occurred in the Holocaust, you need to constrain national democratic sovereignty in order to protect human rights of the juridical person, right? Um, I think this is sort of the essential nature of this lesson. The second lesson I think comes across most clearly um, in the Grundgesetz, so the, um, the basic law or constitution that was imposed on Western Germany on the Federal Republic um, after the war. And that constitution, right, is democratic. It um, has a parliament, right, that can control most laws. But there are a few articles in that constitution that are non-modifiable, including one of the initial articles that protects human dignity and that is supposed to ensure that there can never be a democratic decision to take away the basic rights of individuals. Um, and so I think that the fact that the Western allies imposed that on Western Germany and said, you know, it will actually be impossible for you to ever pass a law or to modify the constitution in order to take away rights from individuals shows the important role that that kind of lesson plays. <coughs> so, right, those lessons in general, in addition to being codified um, in the West German basic law, are also institutionalized in the EU, um, especially in sort of various of its monitoring mechanisms and in the very decision to sort of give the EU um, and its sort of earlier iterations um, decision-making powers that lie outside of the constitutional architecture of the nation state. Um, they become preserved in European law, um, particularly through decisions about the supremacy of European law, um, right? And that again is supposed to protect and ensure that national communities um, or nation states within the EU cannot pass laws that are discriminatory in various ways. Um, so there is almost, um, with the supremacy of European law, there's almost a protection again there. Um, and this occurs not only through sort of the EU and European integration at that level, but also through other institutions of international rights protection in Europe, uh, most notably the Council of Europe and um, it's uh, the European Court of Human Rights that is part of the Council of Europe that for the first time gives individuals the status they require within international law in order to sue member to sue states on their own, right? So that's a step toward, from international towards cosmopolitan law. In other words, from law that only applies between nation states to a form of law that allows individuals to enter into the international realm and gives them status internationally. Um, and this sort of all this background uh, forms the basis for liberal democracy. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the um, the other rupture, the rupture of 1989, um, that is increasingly, I think, challenging the narrative that Western Europe constructs after 1945, right? So for Central Eastern Europe, uh, for the post-communist region, right, it is 1989, not 1945, that is crucial, right? 1945 is also an important date, but is not seen uh, sort of as necessarily as a date of liberation. Um, but more as a date of renewed occupation, right? Especially in the aftermath of 1989, right? In this memory culture, communism is treated as an external imposition, imposition on local populations, 
who were denied popular sovereignty and local control by the Communist Party in Moscow, and more directly by sort of the actions of the Red Army. Um, I will point out, right, that sort of collective memory and these kind of narratives, right, um, they aren't necessarily based on truth and fact, um, at least not in all ways. Um, they are narratives, and they sort of are narratives that are constructed in the present, right? So while it is certainly true that the Communist Party in Moscow did have a high degree of control um, across sort of the communist bloc, it is also true that there was quite a lot of local collaboration. But in this sort of narrative that gets constructed in the aftermath of 1989, um, that the emphasis on that is almost reduced because it's almost in, it's in everybody's interest to sort of move on. And it's in the interest in particular of sort of former communists to sort of uh, play down the old the role that they played and to make it sort of everything seem like it was actually coming from Moscow and that they were just puppets or that sort of if it hadn't been them that somebody else would have done it right that they were just sort of um, in essence almost you know bureaucrats within this broader system and not sort of individual decision makers who could really take decisions on their own. Um, and what's interesting is right that that's a very different kind of narrative than the narrative you get from the Holocaust or 1945. And what results is this kind of hotting up of memory in Eastern Europe. And in particular, right, there's a really kind of interesting dynamic you see where in the aftermath of 1989, right, we're in the middle of this catch-up revolution, um, these kind of um, debates about the meaning of the communist past, about transitional justice or illustration, as it's usually spoken about in Central and Eastern Europe, they're obviously there, um, in particular sort of among the, the victims of communism, right, who are pushing these things. But by and large, debates around those issues are sublimated or put into a second place um, in, order, in order for society to unify for the pursuit of membership to the EU, right? So it's almost, um, a societal agreement or a societal consensus across much of Central Eastern Europe that these societies have to enter Europe. And that consensus actually sort of papers over a lot of differences. And those differences don't come to the floor. They aren't, and they aren't emphasized because you have sort of this desire to sort of project a unified front to Europe and also to cooperate in order to join the EU. Um, after 2004, so after the accession, right? two things kind of happen. One, that goal disappears, right? So the kind of unity, the political unity also starts to disappear. And discussions about, internal discussions about 1989 come up in almost all local contexts. Um, the other thing is that even sort of internationally, those societies no longer have to simply seek to conform to Western European standards, right? They have, while Western European standards were the benchmark for joining the EU, once these countries enter the EU, they want to start to shape those standards or reshape those standards as full members, right? They want to say, okay, we have, we did all these things. Um, we didn't talk so much about communism before we entered. Now we're members. Now we think that you need you, the West, need to start learning from us as well, and that our experiences and our sort of sufferings under communism need to sort of get the same status that the Holocaust has in the West. Um, and so this. So sort of this leads to a real clash um, in European institutions and across much of Europe um, where representatives from Central and Eastern Europe really challenge the centrality of the Holocaust, right? Um, this leads in one example, right, to the Declaration on European Conscience and Totalitarianism. Uh, there's a large debate about the way communism is presented at the House of European History. Um, and there was a picture of that, right, in my previous slide here, um, how that represents um, communism. Uh, there's all sorts of debates in the European Parliament um, about sort of banning Nazi symbols and with Eastern European, East Central European representatives argue that if you ban Nazi symbols, you have to ban communist symbols as well, right? So there's all sorts of sort of symbolic ways um, that this narrative starts to challenge um, the rupture of 1945 or the narrative you have in the West. Um, and in particular, those challenges even start to take on a more political form. And that's because the rupture of 1989 has very different lessons for the present, right? First, it emphasizes popular sovereignty, not rights, right? So the problem um, on this telling, the problem with communism was not so much the fact that 
communism denied basic rights to individuals. It clearly did that. But the problem is that sort of that decisions, that key decisions were not being made locally, right? But were being made in Moscow um, externally, right? So the idea here is that the crucial thing is not to ensure rights protection, but to ensure local control, right? And to ensure that sovereignty lies with the state, with the local community, right? And that they can make decisions, um, right? So that's a very different lesson than the lesson that emphasizes rights over sovereignty in the West. You can see how that's gonna to lead to a clash immediately. The second lesson, or the second thing that leads to a clash is, right? This idea that in across much of post-communist Europe, the nation is seen as a source of freedom for liberation, not as a fundamental danger. But right? if you look at sort of the dissidents um, within a lot of East Central European countries, right? They often are cultural figures, writers, playwrights, um, and other kind of people who are in the cultural fields, who are working in the vernacular um, and using the nation as a way to resist the kind of transnational project of communism coming out of Moscow, right? So here, the nation is a source of liberation. It's not a source of danger as it is for the West, right? The nation is not, nation and nationalism is not a source of war. The nation and nationalism is a source of freedom. It's a way of resisting domination. Again, that's a very different lesson than the one you get in Western Europe coming out of sort of 1945 and the Holocaust. Um, so the key result here is this distinction between liberal and illiberal democracy, right? Liberal democracy based on constrained democracy, um, based on the idea that the nation is something dangerous and illiberal democracy based on this idea that popular sovereignty um, is the most important thing um, and that the nation is a source of freedom. Um, and sort of as sort of you get this clash, right? Post-communist member states always make, are sure to make the claim that they're also pro-European, but seek a Europe of nation states, not a community or a federal EU. Um, and I think these differences are visible in many areas, right? Um, I think something like the migrant crisis um, is a good example, right? Where um, Central and Eastern European member states are very resistant to the idea of the EU imposing quotas on the number of migrants they need to take in, um, very re more resistant to the idea of um, fundamental rights to asylum overriding the right to sort of democratic decision about who to let in, who to give citizenship who to, who to give residency to, et cetera. Um, and I think this kind of vision of the past or sort of the lessons of IT has really been boosted over the last year by the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine, um, where on one level, right, this narrative is boosted by the fact that sort of Central and Eastern European countries were warning about the dangers of Russia um, for a long time, um, whereas sort of a lot of Western Europe uh, was much more accommodationist to Russia and still viewed Russia through the lens um, of World War II, where it was an important ally in the fight against Nazism. Um, but I think also, right, I mean, if you see the Russian invasion, in particular, sort of the images of heroism of Ukrainians fighting back against Russia, um, that has been an image that sort of seems to also vindicate the Central East European idea of the nation as a source of freedom, right, as a source of um, solidarity and cohesiveness um, that arguably um, the more cosmopolitan liberal West lacks, right? That kind of cohesiveness, that ability to sort of unify around a big project. Um, so I think that this sort of raises really important questions about the future of Europe and sort of in particular for the European Union, what it will be and what it will look like, right? From its origins of the 1950s, the EU has been driven um, by divisions between supporters of a kind of more federal or community vision and those that wanted a Europe of nation states. Um, and I think until 2004, right, um, this community vision was able to gradually expand, right, not prevailing in every case, but gradually expand because aggressively integrationist leaders used a series of fait accomplis to resolve a wider battle over alternatives to Europe. Um, and that quotation comes from Craig Parsons, um, wonderful book uh, on the EU, right? So um, in the narrative of 1945, right, 
there is clearly this community kind of vision that is supported, right? This idea that you need to combat nation state nationalism, you need to combat um, the taking away of rights and thus sort of creating democracy at the supranational level in the vision of 1945, or sort of if you're working through that regime of collective memory is a logical consequence. What you get when you try to integrate Central and Eastern Europe and integrate uh, member states that have this, that are whose memories and experiences and ideas are organized around the rupture of 89, is that you bolster the idea of the nation state vision of Europe um, as sort of these countries are much more likely to push back on the kinds of external constraints that the West wants, right? The kinds of external constraints that are enforced by the European legal system. Um, and a good example of this is the Polish challenge to the supremacy of EU over national law. Um, there are sort of all sorts of other examples of this as well, um, right? Um, pushing back against um, various proposals to um, lower the number of commissioners, for example, um, or proposals that come from the West that seeks to sort of um, end, that seeks to sort of move towards majority voting um, and end sort of the rights of nation states to sort of exercise veto powers over European decisions, right? All of these things are ideas that make sense um, from within kind of the structure of memories organized around um, Nazism and the Holocaust, but that actually are completely counter to the kind of instincts you get if you are thinking through the rupture of 1989. Um, and this is where you get sort of this kind of popular narrative or this kind of rhetoric that seeks to portray Brussels as the new Moscow and you as the new USSR. Um, and you get these kind of voices in, part, in uh, parts of sort of um, Central Eastern Europe in particular on the right um, that sort of are really pushing back against any kind of community vision of Europe, right? So very much the idea that yes, there should be a European Union, yes, European cooperation is important, but it has to remain firmly under the control of local nation states and that in some sense Europe should be just about more um, ad hoc coalitions um, around issues that all the member states agree on and not about sort of enforcing um, decisions made elsewhere on member states that do not want them, right? So I think that that really poses a threat to kind of, or shows what is at stake for the future of Europe in these two ideas um, coming out of the past. Uh, so I'm running out of time, but let me just briefly speculate and maybe give you some reasons for hope uh, that this kind of, um, that this disagreement can be resolved, right? So I think in Western Europe, um, where the narrative of 1945 is very strong, I think that narrative is starting to weaken, right? Largely as a result of generational turnover, right? People who can remember the war, who are witnesses to the Holocaust are dying out. And I think that helps to explain why sort of there's a rise of neo-fascist far-right parties um, in, in the, much across much of Western Europe, including here in the Netherlands where I am. Um, and so you're getting a weakening of that narrative. Um, and the rise of a kind of sovereigntist far right that is much closer to um, the narrative of 1989. Um, meanwhile, I think that in Central and Eastern Europe, the current kind of surfeit of memory, and that's Charlie Mayer's phrase, this kind of these memory battles, I think are unsustainable. Um, and I think also, right, even there, the narrative of 1989 is driven by older generations who have real memories um, of the sufferings, of the suffering of, uh, of the sort of crimes and um, repression that they suffered under communism. Um, so I think that hope for the future is to be found in a new generation of Europeans that is not necessarily defined by the symbolic border of 1945 and 1989. In other words, in a generation of Europeans that grew up on a continent of open borders, um, that studied, worked, and traveled a lot, that took advantage right of things like Schengen, um, Erasmus, um, and other programs like that, and I think sort of this hope is captured by the late Umberto Eco, whose picture I put up onto this slide. And Umberto Eco in 2012 uh, had this wonderful uh, quotation where he talks about kind of his hopes for this generation. And he says that this is, quote, the first generation of young Europeans. I call it a sexual revolution. A young Catalan man meets a Flemish girl, they fall in love, they get married, and they become European, as do their children. Um, I think that's a very interesting kind of. Um, idea. I think it's sort of something that 
I certainly have experienced it. I think a lot of my students um, and sort of students in general these days experience, um, right? We know that sort of the number of cross European relationships are on the rise, right? The European Commission about 10 years ago now estimated that there were over a million Erasmus babies, um, right? And those, in some sense, that that is what Europe is really doing at the kind of low at the kind of lowest individual level, right? It is reshaping who our friends are. It is reshaping where our contacts are, and I think it is reshaping um, a whole generation's viewpoint and its horizons, right? A young European now doesn't have to sort of think about merely sort of a top position in their national government or being the head of a national central bank, but can think about being the the head of the Central Bank of Europe, right? Sort of horizons have expanded as well. Um, and so I think the sort of pro-European views of this course code are based not on memories, but on sort of this experience of living and growing up, working, traveling, loving, right, on an open continent. And I think that sort of, it'll be interesting to see to what extent sort of these differences of memories um, are retained in that generation, or to what extent that generation sort of, based on its own experiences, um, has a different view of Europe and will start to reshape Europe as they take the reins of power um, in the next decade or so. So I will leave it at that. Um, I want to mention my book um, in the introduction. Uh, so this is just, uh, I'm just showing the cover here. If you're interested in more, I write about all of these issues uh, at great length um, in the book itself. And in the meantime, I am happy to uh, have some answer some questions and have a little bit of debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, uh, for a very inspiring uh, lecture. And now we can uh, dedicate a few minutes, 15 minutes maybe, uh, for discussion. And I give the floor to Professor Pożarlik. Please, Grzegorz. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Certainly, uh, Peter, you were truly insightful, uh, panoramic epic, yes, in your um, story on uh, actually, yes, memory. Uh, seen through a conceptual lens of generational cleavages, yes, clashes, yes, truly inspiring a uh, contribution. Very well. So please, now the floor is yours. Uh, questions, uh, um, comments, uh, agreements, disagreements, please. Yes, to Peter. Yes. Mm. Uh, I see Omar, yes, please. Uh, yes, thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Professor uh, Vrovshek. I have two questions, but they're related. Um, so the first is, uh, in, the, in the narrative that you present, uh, who advocates for particular frameworks of memory? Uh, and so what I have in mind is, is this um, a story in which what in the literature are called memory entrepreneurs play a big role, or is the process a little bit more diffuse than that? And the second question is, um, if it is the case that it is sort of um, advanced by certain um, memory entrepreneurs, um, what are the limits to how much uh, a particular narrative of history can be, so to speak, stretched um, against the facts? So let me give you two examples. Um, in both uh, Russia and, and Poland, there have been laws passed that um, ex uh, effectively prohibit the identification of war crimes committed during World War II with you know, Russian soldiers, citizens, Polish soldiers, and citizens. Um, but it seems to me that it, it, this kind of imposition would quickly run aground against um, the facts and, and the history that, that many are reasonably expected to be familiar with. Uh, and so I'm wondering about the latitude um, for flexibility and even in, even invention um, that something like memory entrepreneurs have. Uh, but thanks again for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, yeah, Omar, thank you for, uh, for this question. I think it's a really good one. And it's one that I think sort of everyone who works on memory struggles with, right? The sort of what are the dynamics of memory between top down and bottom up? And what are the limits? Um, so, I mean, the story I'm telling and the story I tell in the book um, is very much one about memory entrepreneurs, and in particular about political leaders. Um, 
and that's not really because I think that's the only area that's important or that I think that sort of bottom up social dynamics are not important. Um, it's more a decision that I made just because it's more tractable, right? It's kind of easier to trace. Um, and so in the book, I do a lot of work with um, memoirs and archival work, sort of seeing how the memory of the past actually affected political leaders, um, in particular in the West, right? Because it has been so long since the foundation of the first European community in the 1950s, all those archives are open. And so we can see the way that sort of European ideas were not only about justification publicly, but also how they have helped individuals to sort of rethink their ideas about the state, about politics, but also how it motivated them to overcome hurdles, right? So in that sense, sort of working with leaders is just much easier as a scholar, um, especially in that in an era where that's so far, it's so long ago and where you don't have sort of any kind of polling data or anything like that that you can use. Um, now, I think sort of the fact that sort of a lot of the memory study, memory study scholarship works with leaders and memory entrepreneurs that does not mean that sort of I or other scholars think that um, that sort of the popular ideas are not important or that the bottom up perspective is not important. Um, in fact, I think sort of that the limits in some sense are what people will, will expect. Uh, I think the best person writing about this is Roger Smith, wrote a book called Stories of Peoplehood. And he writes about this very well, where sort of, yes, um, leaders can sort of propagate narratives and they have certain advantages, right? Because they're able to shape school curricula, right? They're able to sort of shape what newspapers write about and cover, right? They have all these kind of advantages, but ultimately the people have to, people from the bottom up have to accept those narratives. And oftentimes even what leaders will say is shaped by sort of what they're hearing from the bottom up, right? Leaders sometimes lead and sometimes they see their people going someplace and they say, oh, where are they going? I have to know that so that I could lead them, right? So in some sense, the leaders are also followers, um, but they are key figures. Um, and I think sort of stretching against the facts, there's certainly a limit to that. Um, and I think the limit is often about the, how, much, how much control you have over the media and the public sphere, um, right? I think sort of, it's much harder, I think, to sort of enforce these kinds of unrealistic memory laws, like the ones you mentioned, and to sort of change people's minds, or at least if you don't change their minds, to sort of force them into acquiescence in a place like Poland, which despite some problems in terms of media um, is still relatively open, right? And, and where more and more people, especially the younger generation speak English, have access to outside media, outside media outlets to a European public sphere that it is in Russia, where sort of control of the internet is much, much higher, where control of national media is much more direct. And it's actually much easier to sort of not only to reshape what the facts are, but even people who might be skeptical, it's much easier to actually get them to sort of just give in or just be quiet. And so I think that in some sense, it's a lot of it is about control of the public sphere. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that because I realize I've been talking for a while already, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of an answer to, to your very big and important questions. Yes, uh, Omar seems to be satisfied, yes, with Peter's uh, um, reply. Very well. Yes, uh, please, any other um, questions, comments uh, to Peter's contribution, please? Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps uh, just, uh, Peter, if I may kind of... Uh, uh, take this opportunity. I was especially pleased with your reference to Tony Judd's uh, post-war uh, perspective. Yes, it's kind of, uh, it's very close to my uh, own um, yes, uh, understanding of uh, uh, yes, building, building um, like generational memory on certain na constructed narrative uh, of the new beginning. The new beginning, yes, uh, kind of, uh, 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 as a watershed uh, in the collective memory. So I was very much pleased with you citing uh, Tony Judd's uh, post-war, indeed. Uh, and uh, also, yes, you are very right. It's very much about uh, generations and they and they were and th they way of uh, remembering and forgetting. So you're absolutely right, saying emphasizing this generational um, factor. Uh, so yes. Um, but yes, uh, please, any other questions, yes, comments uh, to uh, Peter's contribution, please? Mm. 
okay? Understand, yes, that we can now, uh, yes, more carefully uh, indeed uh, read your uh, seminal monograph. Yeah, so uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, still plenty to discuss yes, uh, well, after having actually uh, read your um, Opus Magnum, yes, <laughs> very well. Well, uh, if, yes, yes, Peter. Yeah, I was going to say thank you very much for the for the kind comments, um, Gregor, and uh, I really appreciate it. And I hope yeah. uh, I'm still young enough that I hope I will write more things that are perhaps more important than my first book. But uh, okay. yes, um, I'm very happy that it actually came out in paperback recently, so it's actually affordable, um, whereas mm. the hardcover was certainly not. Um, and if anybody so yeah, sort of is interested, in a lot of I've published sort of various journal articles with a lot of material as well, uh, if you don't want to spend too much money. So yes. thank you so much, Ed. I really appreciate it. And yes, I agree. Tony Judd is amazing. I had the pleasure of um, being able to meet him before he passed away. Um, and yes, I really yes. admire, admire his work and also him as a sort of very important political figure. Um, Indeed, yes. Very well. Um, I've got the impression that we are yes, um, uh, reaching the, the, the conclusion yes, of our uh, seminar today. So with this, I would now ask, uh, please, Joanna, to, for to uh, formally close our seminar today, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for your contributions. Thank you to Omar for uh, very interesting uh, questions. I don't know, Mogorzata, uh, would you like to ask something? Uh, no, I just wanted to show my face at the, <laughs> okay. thing, at the end. But, and of course, I would like to, uh, to say thank you for a very interesting lecture. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. And of course, thank especially you. thanks <laughs> to Peter for a very, very interesting lecture. Uh, and now um, I'd like to remind you that our next lecture will uh, take place in April and see you. Uh, I think it's 24th of April, but I need <laughs> to check it. And thank you once again for enjoying our uh, lecture. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter, uh, for, um, for, uh, uh, for your lecture, for um, very, very interesting contribution. And see you in April. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you all for being here. Bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you.